In our last videos, we focused on the responses of first order systems. In this video, we're going to take a look at second order systems. And once again, we're going to focus on the natural response rather than the forced response. Do you remember what that means? The natural response is the response to an impulse or a step or a ramp while the forced response is the output that corresponds to a sinusoidal input. So today we'll be looking at the step response of a second order system. We're going to follow the same progression as we did last time. That is, first we're going to take a look at some examples of second order systems. Then I'm going to show you what the step and ramp response especially look like. One of the most commonly used examples of a second order system is the spring mass damper system. Now this diagram might look like it doesn't have much connection to reality, but in fact many real systems are spring mass damper systems. For example, suspension systems are spring mass damper systems. Whether it's a suspension system for your car, for your bike, or any other kind of vehicle. Another very common example of a second order system is an RLC circuit. That is, a circuit that includes a capacitor, a resistor, and an inductor. In this example, the input is the voltage and the output is the charge in the capacitor. In this picture, if we would suddenly close this switch, we would be applying a step input of the voltage and we could watch the output of the charge in the capacitor change over time. And the way that the charge in the capacitor changes over time would follow a second order step response. The slinky that we used in the beginning of class is also a second order system. And so are many real life things that sway or vibrate. For example, a suspension bridge is a second order system. When wind blows on the bridge and causes the bridge to sway, that is a second order response where the force of the wind is the input and the position of the bridge is the output. Bleachers are also a second order system. When a crowd of people walks up bleachers and the bleachers sway or vibrate under them, that is a second order response where the force of the people's feet is the input and the position of the bleachers is the output. Perhaps most importantly, all electromechanical systems that have some sort of feedback control are also second order. The motion of an elevator when it takes you from one floor to another is a second order response. The motion of robot joints when they move the end effector from one position to another is a second order response. The motion of the axes on a manufacturing machine like a CNC milling machine or a 3D printer is also a second order response. In order for us to successfully program things like elevators and robots and manufacturing machines, we have to have a good understanding of how a second order system responds to an input. Let's look at that now by looking at the impulse response of a second order system. When we apply an impulse input to a second order system, there are three different ways that the system might respond. The first possible type of response looks like this. This kind of a response is called underdamped. Remember that one of the most common examples of a second order system is the spring mass damper system. The three possible ways that a second order system could respond 
are differentiated from each other according to how much damping is in the system. The underdamped response shows how the system would respond if there is not very much damping in the second order system. Even though we refer to the response of the system as underdamped when there isn't much damping, we're not necessarily only talking about a spring mass damper system. For example, in the RLC circuit example, the amount of damping in the system is determined by the amount of resistance. Even though the system does not have a damper, it has an amount of damping. It's just that the amount of damping is determined by something else, in this case, a resistor. Besides being underdamped, another way that the system could respond is called overdamped. If a system is overdamped, then the response will look like this. In the overdamped case, the response does not have any oscillations and it very slowly approaches its settling point. In the impulse response, the settling point is always zero. In other words, the steady state value is always zero. In the underdamped case, the system oscillates around zero before coming to a rest on the steady state value. In the overdamped case, the system initially responds and then slowly approaches the steady state value. The third way that a second order system can respond is called critically damped. A critically damped response is the fastest response that the system can have without having oscillations. A critically damped response looks like this. It will initially shoot higher than overdamped and less than underdamped, but it will much more quickly approach the steady state value compared to the overdamped case. In the first order step response, we were interested in the time constant of the system. Here, with the second order natural response, there's another parameter that we're interested in and that parameter is called the damping ratio and it's represented by the Greek letter zeta. When a second order system is under damped, that means that it has a zeta parameter that is somewhere between zero and one. This funny symbol that I drew here is the Greek letter zeta and it's called the damping ratio. In the overdamped case, this is where we have a zeta that is greater than one. So I bet you can guess what the case is for the critically damped response. When a system is critically damped, that means that it has a zeta or damping ratio that is equal to one. In fact, when we call this letter the damping ratio, the thing that it is a ratio of is a ratio of the amount of damping that is in the system divided by the amount of damping that the system needs in order to be critically damped. Remember that critical damping means that the system responds, that is, reaches its steady state, as fast as possible without having any oscillations. Besides the damping ratio, there's another very important system parameter that we can get from the impulse response, and that is the natural frequency. In order to find the natural frequency, we have to go through uh, a couple of intermediate steps. The first intermediate step that we're going to do is find something called the damped frequency.
The damped frequency is represented with the Greek letter omega with a subscript D. We can find the damped frequency by measuring the time between the peaks in the impulse response. The damped frequency is related to the natural frequency in this way. The damped frequency is equal to the natural frequency of the system represented as omega sub zero times the square root of one minus zeta, the damping ratio, squared. We can get the damped frequency by measuring the time between peaks. So if we can find some way of measuring zeta from the natural response, we would be able to calculate the natural frequency of the system. So how could we get zeta by looking at our impulse response? Actually, there's an easy way to do this, but the easy way only works as long as the system is under damped. Here's how we do it. First, we measure the amplitude of the first peak. I'm going to call that value A. Next, we measure the amplitude of the second peak, which should be less than the first one because the system is coming to a settling point. This height I'll call C. Now, we can calculate something that's called the decay ratio. The decay ratio is equal to C divided by A. Once we know the decay ratio, we can use it to get zeta, our damping ratio. The damping ratio is equal to E to the exponent of negative 2 pi zeta divided by the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Once we know the damping ratio by measuring our system, we can calculate zeta by solving this equation for zeta. The E here is the same E we saw earlier when we were looking at the time constant of a first order response. So once we have the impulse response of the system, we can find several of its important properties. We can calculate the decay ratio, which will allow us to calculate zeta, the damping ratio of the system. We can also use the time between peaks to calculate the damped frequency. Once we know the damping ratio zeta and the damped frequency omega d, we can calculate the natural frequency of the system. Knowing the natural frequency will be especially important to us once we start looking at the forced response of the system. For now, you should know that you can calculate the natural frequency from the impulse response of the system. Next, we're going to take a look at the step response of a second order system. The step response is going to look very similar to the impulse response in the sense that it can be underdamped, critically damped, or overdamped. But it has one important difference, and that is that it settles on a different steady state value than it started at. With the impulse response, the response starts at zero, and it also ends or settles on zero. Because it settles on a different value than it started at, we can get some other system properties from the step response. Let's take a look at what the step response will look like, depending upon if it's underdamped, critically damped, or overdamped. Here, I've drawn a time amplitude plot, and I've drawn a dashed line to represent the steady state value. An underdamped step response will look something like this. <laughs> 
there are a couple of things that I want you to notice here. First of all, you'll notice that the slope of the response at zero time is different than what we saw with the first order response. With the first order response, the slope at zero was useful to us to use to find the time constant. With a second order response, the slope at time equals zero is actually zero. In other words, the response is totally flat at time equals zero. This is one hint you can use to uh, differentiate between first and second order responses even when the responses look very similar. For example, an overdamped second order step response actually on the surface looks very similar to a first order response. It will look something like this. However, you can tell that this response is not a first order response by looking at the value of the slope of the response at time equals zero. Since the slope starts out at zero, a flat line, we can tell that this is actually an overdamped second order step response. Before I show the critically damped case, I need to correct the way I drew these blue and red lines relative to each other. The overdamped case will always be slower than the underdamped case, so the overdamped case should look something more like this. In fact, as you decrease damping, the system will keep getting faster, but you will introduce more oscillations. So when we draw in the critically damped case, we will have a response that is as fast as possible without having any oscillations. So the critically damped case will be faster than the overdamped, but slower than the underdamped case. This is the critically damped response. I'm now going to draw a diagram of the underdamped case alone in order to show you some of the response properties that we can get from the step response. One property that we can get from the step response is a property that you've already seen in the first order system, the time constant. However, we find the time constant differently with a second order system than we do with a first order system. The way we find the time constant for a second order system is we first identify the point on the response that is what's called the inflection point. The inflection point is the point at which the slope of the response stops increasing and starts decreasing. Once we find the inflection point, we take the slope at the inflection point and we draw a line, a linear fit, with the slope at that inflection point, and this defines our time constant. The time constant is the time between the two intersections. One intersection at the steady state value and the other intersection at zero or the starting point of the response. And this distance in time is the time constant of a second order system. Besides a time constant, a second order system also has a property called the time delay. The time delay is the time between the application of the step input and the point at which the linear fit for the inflection point hits the starting amplitude. So this time here is called L and that L represents the property called the time delay. This capital T, on the other hand, represents the time constant of the system.
Now I'm going to erase the time constant and the time delay in order to show you a couple more important things that you can get from this response. In this second order response, we can look at a value called the peak time, T sub P. The peak time is the amount of time it takes for the response to reach its first peak. We can also look at a value called the rise time. This is the amount of time that the response takes to first reach its steady state value. Another important time in this response is called the settling time. The settling time is the amount of time it takes for the response to no longer oscillate outside of an envelope that is within 5% of the steady state value. So if I would draw some dashed lines here that show a variation of 5% around the steady state value, as soon as the response no longer goes outside of this 5% window, that is the settling time. Another property we can get from this response is called the overshoot. If I call this distance between the greatest peak and the steady state value, if I call that distance A, then the overshoot is equal to A divided by the steady state value. We often express overshoot in terms of a percent where we take this ratio a divided by the steady state and we multiply it by a hundred to get a percent. Now here's the thing that is really surprising and very useful to us. Do you remember how we got those two important parameters from the impulse response? We got the natural frequency and the damping ratio zeta. Each of these characteristics that define how the step response looks has its own equation. And all of these equations have only two variables in them, the natural frequency and the damping ratio zeta. That means that all of these characteristics of the second order step response, the overshoot, the peak time, the rise time, and the settling time can all be calculated by only knowing the natural frequency and the damping ratio. They're all defined by just those two parameters. Once we know the values of the natural frequency and the damping ratio from the impulse response, we can completely predict the step response just with those two parameters.